Is Cormac McCarthy a romantic? Well, I actually just hit up Cormac McCarthy and asked him about his thoughts on romance and his multiple wives, and this is what he had to say. I don't know both of them. He's just, yeah. he's an attractive man. I mean. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> No, everyone, we are not talking about Valentine's Day romance today. We are talking about romanticism's relation to Cormac McCarthy. And this is a start of a new series where we are going to be exploring literary, literary tradition's relation to Cormac McCarthy's works and seeing if McCarthy even fits in the boxes that scholars always try to put him in. You know, McCarthy is a Gnostic, a postmodernist, a romantic, whatever. So we're going to explore all of those over time and see if the labels actually fit. And today, we're going to be relying on one of my favorite pieces of McCarthy scholarship, Shreds of Matter, Cormac McCarthy and the Concept of Nature by Julius Grave. Grevy, I don't know how to say his last name. We'll be bringing in a couple other people. I just wanted to bring that up because I'm just the dead weight of the Cormac McCarthy community. Without these guys, I'd still be trying to figure out what the road was about. So first, let's just hop into some of the broad definitions of romanticism and see if they align with McCarthy. Let's do a gut check. So does McCarthy have the American thread of romanticism exemplified in Whitman, Emerson, and Thoreau's work, kind of that worship of nature? Do we see characters in McCarthy's works worshiping nature? I would say no. You could say with some of the pros, especially, you know, in The Orchard Keeper, that McCarthy himself is worshiping nature with, you know, bringing in that nature prose, but that doesn't really fit my gut check. In more of the classic sense, do we see McCarthy's characters sensually involved in nature or, or you know, or narratives that have a sensual, as Grave puts it, artist-subject relation with nature? You know, I'm, I don't see that either. You could even say that McCarthy has rejected the ideals of romanticism and made a strong step towards science and away from the idealization of nature in his last two novels or even last three or four novels. However, of course, you know, there is individualism. There is kind of this emotive nature to some of McCarthy's characters throughout his novels. You know, the whole Border Trilogy has a lot of individualistic, emotional characters on this journey immersed in nature. And the heightened emotions of that, you know, some of the violence in his novels brings out, you know, because terror is a part of romanticism. Some of the these, you know, newer, darker emotions could be argued are romanticism. And there's a Cormac McCarthy scholar out there that actually wrote a specific paper that is 20 or 30 pages long on this, but it's behind a $130 book that your boy can't afford right now. So I might just begin all this wrong, but I think we're on the right track. However, my gut check may be wrong because if we look at the two main subgenres of romantic literature, Gothic, gothic literature and the historical romance, McCarthy's works can slide into those genres, of course, at times. If you read, you know, the recently released book, Books Are Made Out of Books, A Literary Guide to Cormac McCarthy, you know, Hawthorne, Poe, and other romantics pop up throughout, especially his earlier works in terms of influence. And to quote Lydia Cooper, who hopefully can come on the show, she says that the Orchard Keeper and Blood Meridian play on the sublime effects of attraction and repuls repulsion to shed light on the unspoken realities of Americans' unspoken past, which is one of the hallmarks of the Gothic style. And Gravy makes the assertion that Mel Herman Melville is a Gothic or a Romantic writer at some level, and, you know, obviously that's McCarthy's biggest influence. I'm a little bit iffy on that. You know, I guess we could call him a gothic writer. That's not maybe not the most traditional labeling, but you go a, a step deeper. I could see how that's actually very right. And if we want to talk about the historical romance quote, and we're qu quoting Stephen Fry here, in the broadest sense, the novel employs the formal features of the American historical romance through a character distinctly human but configured as mythic through his heroic action and his tragic en tragic encounter with a changing world. And this is talking about the crossing. And then we see, you know, then when we add some of the, you know, beautiful nature descriptions in the crossing and some of the more spiritual aspects that Billy experiences with the wolf, you can see how the crossing is a, a novel that exemplifies romanticism. If we had to pin the crossing, you know, comment down below in any literary tradition, you know, other than McCarthy's own, what would you call it? I guess you could, you know, one of the better arguments would be a modernist piece. But then whose modernism is it's not Pound's modernism. Is it you know, maybe more of a 
Robinson Jefferson modernism. So when we combine all the elements that we've talked about and all the great comments down below who are going to expand and aid this conversation, I would rate Cormac McCarthy and his relation to romanticism probably a 6.5 and we're going to put that on the leaderboard right now and we are going to move through all the literary traditions and see which one aligns with McCarthy the most because obviously the answer is none because McCarthy is his own style. But us critical thinkers love labels so let's rate the labels and if you have not checked out my review of Stella Maris yet you gotta see it. Peace.